Hey, hi everyone. So today we're joined by Sarah Peebles, who is a Toronto-based American-Canadian composer, improviser, installation artist. Much of her work over the last few decades has explored unconventional methods of amplification and manipulated found sound, and she'll talk more about that, um, and distinctive approaches to improvising and composing with the Japanese mouth organ. And since 20, 2008, she has created an umbrella of projects called Resonating Bodies. And this, pro this umbrella project addresses native bees, pollination, ecology, biodiversity, um, and these include outdoor habitat installations, gallery works, videos, and web-based works, and collaborations with a lot of different kinds of people from bee biologists, technicians, artists, craft people working in a variety of disciplines. So her activities have encompassed, yeah, collaborations with these people in different disciplines, with musicians, visual artists, data visualizers, scientists, um, and she's created music for dance, multi-channel sound, radio, video and film, performance art, integrated media, sound installation, earthworks, and improvised performance. So a lot of her um, audio can be found at, at websites that I'll share with you in the chat while she's talking. Um, but yeah, we're just excited to hear from her today about some of her projects, specifically this one that uh, has this multi-sensory component to it. So yes, take it away, Sarah. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Um, well, okay, I wanted to talk about Dwelling, uh, Shenandoah Valley. It's the second in a series of um, earthworks that involve sensory cabinets that have been integrated into them. So um, because uh, I'm interested in trying to get people outside to um, be in an environment that uh, we, you know, the kind of environments we seek to connect with outdoors uh, to experience art, that seems to me to be a, a great way to, to address how to um, create a mental image of biodiversity. That's kind of where I started in 2008. I was interested in creating a mental image of biodiversity. The more I learned about native bees, the more I, um, wanted to tell that story uh, in a way that had a, as deep a meaning as possible. And this work um, is in a region that has bees that nest in mud, uh, make these tunnels with these crazy tubular uh, chimneys going out of them. And it also has all of these solitary bees and solitary wasps that uh, live in stems and that dig their tunnels in the ground and so forth. So uh, I brought together the cabinets that I had been working with, just cabinets standing alone that are allowing you to listen and watch uh, solitaries in one sort of environment and, and bring that into a larger work. So um, I'm doing this through a series of, oopsie, there we go. Series of things here. So as you can see, um, you can see most of that screen perhaps. You might be able to make your, um, I'm gonna make my thing very small here. My, So I see most of what you see. You might not know, I don't know how many of you know about native bees and uh, you know different kinds of solitary insects. So I thought I'd just start with the signage that Ty Ralston, the, the, uh, the curator of this venue um, created because he is a native bee researcher and he's also a botanist. So uh, we'll see some, some wall building uh, or rather, um, yeah, building walls within cavities. Uh, what what it is is that these do within wood cavities when they're uh, creating nests, because uh, there are solitaries that create within um, vacated beetle bores in wood, and uh, there are solitaries that, as I mentioned, make their own tunnels in the ground. That's most solitaries, and others that, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, dig into mud. 
to make their tunnels on like riverbanks and trees that have blown over that have a whole bunch of mud in the trees, in their roots, for example. But also there are many other biota within these nests. Uh, there are cuckoo bees, uh, cuckoo flies, bee flies, kleptoparasitic wasps, parasitic wasps. Uh, it's a long list of things that one can see when one is going to look in, um, in, in these, uh, there we go, in, uh, in these nests. So as the sign uh, helps people understand uh, there's a sensory cabinet involved here and uh, it's an immersive process of observing that we get to have. Here's the mining bees that we'll see a little more of as I go along. Um, different kinds of mason bees and wasps. So dwelling is a pretty large uh, structure, really. I think it's 30 tons of uh, adobe. It's not adobe per se, because the, we did not make blocks of adobe ahead of time. We made cob. We'll see a little bit of that. It's, it's a mixture of earth and um, chopped hay and sand aggregate which has been used uh, around the world in many cultures throughout a long period of time, uh, especially, you know, places, you know, in drier climates use uh, adobe, you can see in, in many countries. Um, I also wanted to address in, with biodiversity, what, what it, the animals are interacting with. So the site itself becomes really important to, it's a larger site, it's, uh, it draws you to it, it's a contemplative space and it sits at the intersection of four different kinds of land use areas within this arboretum. And that was really uh, really um, important once I started to realize the larger context of the place that I was given to build this. So uh, there is a community garden, an unmanaged field, managed collections of woody shrubs and trees, like many arboretums, and a managed restored field and marsh with native plants that they burn regularly called uh, the Virginia um, Native Plant Trail, I believe. Uh, and um, beyond that, also there are conventionally farmed um, fields. So this is really intersecting those places. Um, so you can see some of the arboretum on the other side here. You can see it's a fairly large structure. It has a roof because it would just get washed away by the rain, of course, without the roof. This is our group of bees that look like bumblebees, but they're actually anthophora, which are uh, tunnel digging solitary bees, but they aggregate. And uh, there are many kinds of anthophora in different parts of uh, the world. And so these are uh, abrupta and um, actually in Virginia there are native and non-native uh, anthophora that perhaps we could say compete with one another. Uh, I don't know if we know the extent to which they really compete but uh, Marilyn brought in anthophora from Japan in 1989 agricultural reasons and um, so that raises a lot of questions so uh, an artwork like this can help uh, provide a focus for uh, contemplating those questions and even maybe doing some research around those questions, it seems to me. Uh, th these are the boxes of anthophora that we first actually took from somebody's house who had them already. He's a scientist in the region. His name is Sam Drogi, a well-known guy, uh, works for the USGS and uh, devotes much of his time to native bee research and outreach as well. So this is what uh, 
these were placed right next to his house by a PhD researcher several years previous, Lisa Cooter, and then they didn't need all of them. So um, I think it was Ty who uh, kindly uh, transported them uh, from Sam's house to, to here. So it's about two hours or so. If you could go straight, maybe be an hour and a half drive pretty much in the vicinity. And the purpose of these uh, mud boxes with nests already there, it, of course, is to seed the wall because it's pretty hard to get these bees interested in something you've just put in the middle of an environment. There, there are Anthophora that the curator uh, has seen flying around quite a bit, but that doesn't mean it wouldn't take five years for them to decide to get into this wall. So here they are again. And um, the little tunnels that they make, I just wanna mention are, are these little chimneys, the chimneys on the outside of those tunnels. And no one knows really quite why they're there, but they might be there for um, reasons that have to do with thermal regulation. Um, I'm not sure why. And so my idea was to create a wall that would have a pattern on it that would accommodate an unpredictable result. So a lot of thought went into um, getting together with someone who could assist me in creating a design that would still look really interesting with these chimneys eventually uh, coming out of the, the clay work um, in, a, in a kind of quasi random way and, you know, look compelling. This is the inside curve. We worked in several colors uh, on the outside of this. And we just uh, actually ran sticks along the wall and connected them haphazardly uh, in a semi-improvisational way. And um, I will sh show you a few photos of, of, of us doing that. That's a mud dauber wasp that decided to, I don't know what that, I think uh, maybe there's a little bit of moisture in that area of the wall and this wasp is taking some of the moisture from that wall to use in making a nest. Here's the cabinet. Uh, so you can sit on this lovely stone slab and look on this inside that door, or you can stand on the other side of the door and look on the other side of the plank because it's double sided. So on the double side of this plank, uh, the cabinet having two sides are illustrations. And as I say, I, I collaborate or with um, and, and also hire technicians to do a lot of this stuff because this is not my skill set. So Marianne Elberga is the pyrographer who worked with me on creating these illustrations. And um, uh, Jennifer Rong made the cabinet. My partner, Rob Crookshank, did the electronics. Um, so we have solitary bee life cycles is what I wanted to do. We have the life cycle that, the illustration that describes the life cycle within a uh, stem that you might see and the flowers that a particular bee, you know, we chose a bee, right? And a flower to pair with the bee on each side of the cabinet. In this case, it would be a kind of a resin bee, uh, known as a bellflower resin bee. I can show you a video later. Um, one of the bees in the megachylae genus of leafcutter bees, although in this case, they use resin. Um, let's see if I can't. On this side, we have the minor bee, the Anthophora featured uh, in the wall itself. So also just commonly known as minor bees and their life cycle, whoops, I don't think I can move, I can move that, yeah, here we go. 
so they have a, a chamber that this isn't the earth, right? So the wall surface that might have been a riverbank surface or a tree root surface, and they create these cells underground. And eventually you can get thousands of bees aggregating in one place before they have a boom and bust cycle, which is something, of course, uh, that can be observed over time. You can do some citizen scientists with this. They really love Virginia bluebells, uh, among other things. And let's see here. We just looked at that. So here is the cabinet when you open it up. You have somewhere to plug in your headphones. You have a loop. Um, a magnifying glass, you a magnifier put up to your eye to see what is in the nest plank as you listen. You have a volume knob, a start button that shuts off automatically. And also the inside of the doors have some wood burning with some more, listing some more things you might see inside the cabinet. So I'll sh you might have noticed that these look very similar. One side, you just saw, it's a mirror image of itself on the other side of the plank. So that when you, <laughs> you could take a photo of both sides and compare who went where, if you felt like it. Um, in this case, we have some mud nesting wasps in one of those tunnels. Um, this is a kind of, uh, it's a pugnata, it's a, a kind of leaf cutter bee that chews leaves and uses those to create its nest. Um, this might be a resin nesting bee. It, it could be a, quite a few things going on in there. And this is a different kind of mud using wasp. This is a wasp that was seen looking out of the plank at the end where it comes and goes out of the tunnel. This is actually an ant in here. Um, so there's quite a variety of things. You can see how the end of the whole tunnel has been plugged there with masticated or chewed leaves. So when you're inside, you know, you see beyond, you have an experience of, of, of um, taking in this lovely place that's all around you. And, uh, and so you get kind of a, a nice mix of an experience of being focused on interior small spaces, uh, things you don't usually see that are usually in the dark and in, within, you know, the habitat around you. And then you can also expand your view and look at the habitat around you. Um, the stones here were made from cattle walls that exist all around Virginia and all around this place. Cattle walls were commonly made by slaves uh, throughout um, the slave using period of history in Virginia and elsewhere. And this arboretum is situated on uh, a large portion of what was a plantation that was gifted to the University of Virginia, I think in the 20s. And much of that plot or plot, much of that land, I think it's 700 acres, is um, an experimental farm called Blandy Experimental Farm. And a subset of that maybe 300 acres is the Arboretum. So there were a bunch of old walls that were falling down that were just becoming uh, a part of, you know, shrubbery, things growing uh, randomly that they said we could use. And um, this is part, in part, you know, it's a sort of homage to the 68 slaves that, uh, you know, did, should be a part of, I think, uh, 
uh, paying tribute to, to the history of Landy. Um, and the earth was taken from, I don't know, about 200 feet away, 300 feet away in a part of an excavation they'd already begun that we then mixed with these other things. So I had a lot of people helping me do this. Obviously, at first we had some volunteers and we had a person coordinating those volunteers who had a lot of skills with um, creating uh, in cob and some skills creating with stone. But as you can see, uh, that was not um, uh, totally, you know, super high level professional stone setting job, but that was okay. Um, stones like this were uh, actually, there is a professional stone mason in the area and he assisted at the end with putting in this seat and making sure that the stones were safe. And also uh, most of this was built by um, then uh, two other people who um, did uh, the construction on, on most of this really, David and Brian, uh, David Waters and Brian Bedman. So of course my place in this is I, I knew what I wanted. I had models um, and uh, worked together with the builders to make this what I wanted it to be as well as with the uh, artisanal plasterer who came at the end. So I spoke about the bees that make their tunnels within the wall. And you know there can be these different colors that go on as well. Uh, the mud that comes out of the wall can contrast with the plaster that's on the wall. So there are a lot of opportunities for being creative in how to build the wall, which we did. And uh, I'm going to show you some photos about that. Uh, the artist statement I've just said much of, um, talk about how it's a contemplative place uh, and space in which to um, think about biodiversity that's around the area and what you're seeing. Um, and also uh, I wanted to talk about the relationships between the animals around there, the pollinators and the plants and the insects, the soil and the birds and other animals, but also to speak to weather and time and the view to speak to time and space and the shifting ecologies of this place and beyond this place. And so uh, I think it does, it has the potential to do that very well. And that's kind of what I'm aiming for here. It's not a really huge space. It's about big enough for maybe a group of 10 to comfortably be in. Uh, or group things, but it's really great if you have one or two people as well, it still feels really intimate. And uh, yeah, this is a very nice view of an oncoming weather system. Saw a lot of that there. And it was commissioned by the State Arboretum of Virginia. And of course, I'm grateful to, to them for that uh, opportunity and all of their assistance, which was a ton. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about the location. So I spoke of the four different land use areas. So here is where this uh, basically went here and this uh, the garden, the community garden, these are, this is unmanaged, uh, the, this is managed, this is restored, this is managed, this is conventionally farm fields. So once I had an understanding of what's surrounding this, I thought, oh, that it was really a in very interesting situation to be able to do this in because you could um, step away and, and take a closer look at all of these things and ask yourself how pollination ecology works or you know, what, what is going on with pollination ecology and all of these different kinds of 
areas and, and it helps us understand how do we how do we want to manage land? I mean, it helps us ask those questions of how do we want to manage land? Because even when we're not managing land, we're still managing land by not doing anything. Um, it's still a decision with consequences. So uh, none of this has easy answers, but it's not supposed to have easy answers. Um, but it's an opportunity through art to help ask questions and look at complex situations. So here's where the site ended up being. There's the garden, a bit of a hill that became a burned area and native plants. Here's the garden and that's the beginning of the installation. People actually ride horses through here. They have a horse trail. I find that interesting. So there's so many groups of people who use Blandy. I, I couldn't have been luckier really in having a venue like this to be able to create this, to realize this vision. I really wanted to realize on a, on a, you know, a nice professional scale in a, in a way that was, you know, well done, really well done. Um, and so this means, you know, we do have gardeners that come and, and look at the work. We do have people who ride by on horses and get off or don't, people who walk their dogs, people who just come around. Um, it's a very, uh, what would I say, um, a, 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 a very non-commercial arboretum. You can't get a cup of coffee there. You can use the washroom and you can park for free and it's well used by the larger community. It's it's. It's really kind of a gem in that region that people really value. Sarah, can I ask you a question in the chat? Um, mm. I don't know if you're going to get to this, but I think this is a good question for a lot of the students, I think are probably interested in the details of the process of this. Like, so Marina asks, what kind of models did you make? Um, Cause you said you were involved in the modeling part of it. And were they show. paper 3D printed? If you're going to get to that, we can. I will it. get to it. I okay. will get to it. There was just a model. That's all. Just a clay model with everything measured out as best to my ability. But um, when it comes to the roof, I want to say that the roof uh, was designed in designed by a firm, an engineering firm uh, that the university had a connection with, uh, and so that was really important. Uh, you know, it's fundamental. So I wasn't, a, I talked, I had dialogue with a firm about how I wanted the pitch. Did I want it to be uh, flat or not flat? And, you know, some of those details and how large did I want it to be? So that's Ty, uh, the curator. There's a little mud dauber nest that is uh, unanticipated. They just did it. Leaf cutter bee with an ant, and evidently a mud dauber wasp had been in there after that. So there's competition that goes on within these planks. Uh, Isodontia wasp grass, a grass using wasp that stuns certain kinds of in insects, probably katydids. Spiders get stunned and put in to provision. So eventually, these are the first. Uh, developments uh, a couple of years ago um, of these turrets on the wall. And there is uh, the necessary water is very important. So having water nearby um, in the wild, there will usually be a creek or something like that that is well used. And here's the uh, so there's my amazing, isn't that great? Uh, <laughs> uh, so our initial plan actually was not to have a standalone roof over it. And it was a complex series of things that happened. And I'm not gonna, that took a bit of time to discuss. So it, and it doesn't really matter. We ended up with a standalone roof over it. And so the best as I was able to, I 
put together how much distance I wanted between things and what things would look like on the land and took photos, a lot of photos of this at different angles. So the stone was my cabinet and uh, there's a solar panel up there. Uh, actually, the solar panel is on top of the roof. And yeah, it's about a two foot thick wall. And it's about three feet high to begin with, going up to seven feet or so up there. The first part, uh, making it looks like this. So this is Brian Redman and David Waters. And uh, it looks pretty rough. And what cob looks like when you're making it. This is a volunteer, I'm, her name is Lisa. Um, poking holes in the wall to facilitate the drying of this material. Ended up um, mixing a lot of it in a cement mixer actually. Uh, these things got taken out later because we didn't, we were going to put a green roof on it, like a green roof that went along the whole spot. I want to say spiral, it's not, you know, the U shape of it, like a kind of a slender green roof, but uh, that was not feasible. And this is part of the art process basically is to say that, you know, we found that the things didn't go the way we thought they would go. And the stone foundation um, was not up to snuff to support that, which is why it was really important to have, um, you know, people involved who could address these things and, and uh, you know, many people looking at this beyond me and uh, to make sure we had everything uh, accounted for and safe for the long term. So it's uh, safe and fine for not having anything on top of the cob. I wanted to talk about what's inside the cob, but I wanted to put these inclusions in so that you might end up seeing them later. So inside we buried stuff that were different mixes of cob. Cob has a lot of different mixes. You'll have one part, uh, one part sand, what kind of sand you want, you know, mason sand, fine sand, not fine sand, deeper subsoil was more clay rich. Uh, and um, this is also for me as an experiment uh, to see if the bees gravitated towards one thing or another, which is kind of hard question to answer, but you might as well ask the question. This is a bit different. This is shallow subsoil, not as red. So when they're making their chimneys, you know, is the chimney, we don't even know that much about these bees. Where are they getting the mud for their chimneys? Are they getting it from way back in their tunnel? How far back are their tunnels going? So I thought this could maybe uh, provide some interesting insights into how bees are making their tunnels and if they care about um what the if the wall is built of really um you know clay rich if it's a super clay rich wall or a lot more sand or whatnot do they care um don't know but maybe someday we'll know a little more as this wall progresses so thank you yeah, we have four or five different inclusions that are on the inside of the wall. And eventually, you know, the exterior gets covered up by plaster and the plaster is earth plaster. Um, this David shaping the wall. I was involved in, in creating the wall as well, but in a very fundamental sort of way. So I put on as much you know, uh, of this cob as I could. And I, I helped uh, with some of the easier elements, trying not to get in people's way. Again, we took down these things because these were a part of a previous design that we decided not to go with. Embedding the cabinet was really interesting and really um, something we had to think through very carefully. And so David had a lot of experience in working with Cobb and came up with a um, 
a way that he wanted to embed this cabinet uh, that I don't, I'm not gonna show you photos of right now, but it's not just sitting there. It has a, a very um, a rigorous and strong way of tying it in to this clay with some posts and making sure it doesn't fall out basically. Uh, you can see that different parts of the wall had some different mixes of clay of cob going on. Uh, and both of those builders, Brian and uh, David, were also creating the roof as well. So they um, brought all of, all those skill sets to this job, which was extremely lucky. So doing making this art was really dependent upon who's available to assist me in making it as well. So as an artist with a, a vision that I want to see happen, I have to think really carefully about where can I do this and who's there to help and what's the budget? Are they going to drive there? Am I going to fly them there or what? So these guys could drive there and Blandy could put us all up. So you can see how nice and smooth the wall is there. Uh, once he's finished, uh, this is the cabinet right here, uh, taped up so it won't get you know full of clay. Um, and, and everything actually looks really quite proper and beautiful. And yet there are several stages left to go in dealing with the plaster. It's about ready now to be plastered. So this is where the next, whoops, this is where the next person comes in. This is sideways, so I guess that's just the way it is. It's a sideways slide. We'll go to the next one. Oh no, how did that happen? That's not okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, this is Gabe, Gabe Franklin. Um, he's an artisanal plaster, and so he's working with how underneath the cabinet, you know, it 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 looks against the stone and how detailing it's called detailing uh, how something looks um i'm sorry those are sideways there we go so preparing it for plastering there's a process to go on with that um we use three different colors of plaster from different kinds of muds uh that were naturally those colors uh, that he brought with him from Pennsylvania. He drove down also. So there's a technique that he introduced to this project, which was smearing on a color and kind of spreading it out with a trowel and then um, refining that with the trowel a bit and, and, and getting these broader strokes so that it all looks kind of like oh, a painting in a way, really. There you go, that's better. So uh, we were able to do that together. That was one of the things I requested. We had a, you know, a fair bit of back and forth months ahead of time. And I told him I really wanted to try to do an approach to this wall where I could be involved doing it. And I'm not just, you know, watching someone do it and telling them if I like it or not. And, and he's uh, very good at um, coming up with approaches that fit different situations. And this was a great way of preparing this wall where I could be involved. So once those colors dried, we added those lines. And as I mentioned, uh, he had this great idea of making lines and then connecting them, but not thinking too hard about it. Just being a bit improvising, a bit imp improvisory about it. Um, feeling like we can let go of a bit of control, which is an interesting thing to do, but I am an improviser anyway. I improvise with music and that leads me to improvise with life. Actually, I've been uh, an improvising musician doing free improv since I think uh, 1991. So I do welcome these opportunities to try to um, approach something from uh, 
from a place of being in the moment and trying to let go of some of the desire to control. And this is what we get. Um, I would say that, uh, yeah, I also added the idea of tapering off this pattern on the front end of the wall so that it's, it kind of flows from the front side um, and, and it guides your eye around the wall. So maybe we'll see that photo in the next batch. I would like to show you Paint Branch Creek, which is where this idea came from or originated. Yes, it originated with a PhD student in biology at the time doing her PhD on bees mining bees and Thopro, Lisa Cooter. And we created this um, smaller wall uh, with volunteers and a much artistically rougher project. Uh, the cabinet is actually um, uh, uh, like a sister cabinet to the other one. So they are um, pretty much the same, but with slightly different illustrations. And in this case, we they did make a little green roof on that because our original idea melted. We had an original idea to put rocks on top because we were inspired by another artwork we saw that did that, which is an artwork called um, Always Becoming. Uh, quite a famous piece at the American Indian Museum uh, in, um, in DC by Nora Norranho Morris. And she has uh, uh, an earthwork that is topped in stone that changes slightly over time or quite a bit over time. But ours began to melt. So <laughs> there's a long story to this. I'm not gonna get into this long story about the creation of this. It's quite a lovely story, but uh, this is dwelling also in the dwelling series, Paint Branch Creek, because the creek called Paint Branch Creek is in this vicinity at the University of Maryland. And the, there are classes that regularly use this area. And this is a pollinator garden that was also created next to it um, for grad. Uh, Olivia, I don't know Olivia's last name, I'm sorry. Uh, but Olivia created that garden uh, for masters, master gardeners. And so, uh, is really fortunate. This is actually a small arboretum of sorts. They consider the entire campus an arboretum. So this is the Arboretum Outreach Center. Um, and uh, this, some of these people are Lisa Cooter's family. Um, two nest planks, when you look at them, uh, each side comparatively, you get you see that bees didn't do the same thing on both sides, right? The west side, the east side. Uh, making this earthwork. We did it in different layers that had um, specified mixes as a similar sort of experiment. Do bees gravitate towards something or not? And here are the stones that we initially hoped would do the trick and didn't. So I did make a little diagram of what, what, what parts of this wall had exactly what mix. One sand, two garden soil, less straw, that sort of thing. We could refer back to it in the future. This is on my website. If you want to look at the website uh, in more depth at some point, I would like to show you a video it's 4.48 and you have, you want some questions, but uh, these are here, I'll start over here. So these are the resin using bees. And maybe you can hear this audio. This is online as well. Yeah, it's kind of faint, but it's 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 very uh, 
faint right now. So you get the idea, right? And um, I also want to show you, <laughs> this is what that original wall ended up looking like. It's crazy. So that's the random looking um, chimneys they make off of their nest. You don't know where they're going to do that. And that's, I think about the year number four or year number five for this initial wall that was made. So, so I think I have pretty much, um, yeah, pretty much finished what I was going to say. Perfect. Because um, um, we have a question while you're um, still have all that stuff up. Um, can can you speak to how you went about deciding which features to include in the exhibit to enhance the audience's experience? For example, the cabinet to view the hive, the auditory component, design of the mud bank, et cetera. Can you say that again? How did I go yeah. about yeah, it's in the chat also. So how do, how do you go about deciding which features to include in the exhibit to enhance the audience experience? I have been creating cabinets as standalone features that uh, are not embedded in anything since 2011. So I think there have been, I don't know, four or five cabinets that have been made. And so eventually, it was brought to my attention that there are bees that nest in mud. So that was a, that was news to me. And I thought that that was really neat. And uh, I met Lisa, she was interested in doing something with that. And we knew that they nested in houses in Egypt that were made of mud. Uh, and we knew they nest, nested in houses in Maryland that were made of mud. And so the notion of putting these two things together was, uh, you know, pretty, pretty easy fit, right? Came without thinking too hard. And that's how that came about. Does that answer the question? So, um, any other questions from anyone? I was just curious if you'd speak to the music part of this, like what you've been able to do with um, the audio that you record from their nesting and stuff like that. Um, or do you yeah, know? Okay. Well, if uh, I'm gonna actually answer one part of this other question as well. Sure. I just also wanna say that there is no hive. There are no honeybees. There's no honey, there's no wax. These are native bees. So um, the cabinet, the cabinets have in, included features that have been developed uh, over several generations of cabinets now, or several versions of cabinets over the last 10, 12 years. How did I design the mud bank? Uh, in this case, I played around with mud um yeah with you know with clay clay models i played around with clay models and i was trying to figure out how might you be able to see out of both sides of that cabinet and wouldn't it be nice to have a window in there and i i, I think i just had these visions of cabinets embedded in houses or other things going through my head for years and so you know refined some of those thoughts um this isn't about music or sound so to um to answer your question a bit more i'm more interested in what you might call an emergent property what happens when you combine um using 
a loop with uh, headphones that are going to both ears and are taking this audio gathered from that nest blank. This is inside the nest blank. So when you when you're listening and watching small things up close at the same time, um, you get a very specific experience that I think is particularly valuable to understand, to bring meaning, to bring additional meaning to um, ecology and our understanding of ecology. It's trippy, so, you know, trippiness in art is always fun. So it's not exclusively about educating the public, right? It's, it's also about just a valuable experience on many levels. And, um, and so that helps us, obviously, I think, with the mental image of biodiversity. So this emergent property, it's also tactile. Um, and I think it's because it's not coming out of loudspeakers. It, the sound is coming out of headphones. And that seemed to be really uh, important to this experience because it goes into your head. It seems to just go right into your head. And because you've taken out all of the other things you'd normally look at and you're only seeing these very small things in their tunnel, if you do that for a good 10 minutes, you start to identify with the thing you're looking at and you start to appreciate what they're doing, you almost could feel like you have six legs if you do that enough. And, and that's an interesting, strange, like why would that be? It's for a reason, right? That, that, that's because that's how psychology, that's the psychology of combining these senses in this way. So do I take audio recordings? I do, but I don't really care much about the audio recording. I care about being in that place, doing that, looking at those living things. But you might be thinking about the videos, right? And so the videos just started doing to document and to try to bring to uh, the process of conveying what is the outdoor experience. And the videos also do have, um, which, and the videos have, because the audio is so important to the video, um, they have, yeah, they have their own special value, I'd say. And we did bring some poetry to those videos with my collaborator, Stephen Humphrey, um, that sort of thing, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, Sarah. Um, and everyone has this recording now and your websites to look at more of the fun stuff you've done. Um, you know, I was, shall I tell everyone about the talk that we're going to put online? Is this a good time to do that as well? Sure. Just briefly? Yeah. Um, I just want to mention that. Um, Uh, some of those videos that I just mentioned are a part, are, are a very important part of a gallery exhibit that uh, Rob Cruikshank, Ellie Willoughby, and myself, along with poet Stephen Humphrey, created. Uh, the gallery uh, exhibit was including some works that are made up of uh, mostly of works. Uh, little dioramas that had um, both the sound and the visual component of four of our favorite bees. Uh, and then we did an artist talk about this. Uh, and one more piece of, uh, one more new work that Ellie and I created is also in this that is uh, in the landscape and featuring uh, a video and some print, some print, uh, what am I trying to say? Lino cut prints of various flowers in a, in a, an unusual way. And so the talk that we did in July is going to be online pretty soon. And the four of us are talking about our approaches to our work and how science is involved in some of that work, or at least um, not, not science as in doing science and taking data, but rather taking um, information that, that we know about bees and plants that uh, we know partly through science, right? And um, 
talk about our process. Very cool. I'll definitely share that when the video comes out. And it seems like a really cool collaboration. Um, Thank you. And I'll put that on the, the website of Resonating Bodies and people can go to uh, Resonating Bodies uh, website. I don't think I have it up here, but um, yeah, uh, you can. I sent it in the chat. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I sent it in the chat and I can send it out later in an email. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Cool. So here's uh, resonating bodies. Uh, mm -hmm. You may get to that at some point. And it shows you, yeah, you know, uh, work that's been done over, yeah, 10 years or so. So, so I hope that uh, that told you some stuff about sensory experiences with bees and, and how uh, bringing together audio and visual and earthworks are one approach to making art with uh, science. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I know I have another meeting at two and probably everyone else, so you might have to jump off, but we have some comments here about liking how you incorporate functionality into aesthetics and a lot of people saying thank you. So oh, good. Yeah. So Thank you, and um, yeah, until next time. Okay, have a good day.